Good evening, everybody. Welcome to CFI Insider. My name is Melissa Myers. I'm the National Field Organizer for Center for Inquiry and your host for tonight. Thanks for joining us for this episode of CFI Insider. Tonight, we're going to be joined by constitutional lawyer and chair of CFI's board of directors, Eddie Tabash. And at the end of the program, you'll have a chance to speak and ask questions using the, the Q&A function in the chat. Tonight, we're going to ask everybody to stick to questions specifically pertaining to the separation between church and state, just since our time is limited. And we'll let you know when it's time to, to ask those questions. I hope you got a chance to get the download that came with this registration. It's a little bit different. You had a little homework. In case you missed them, I'm going to drop them in the chat right now for you to access. This program is going to cover a lot of ground, so let's go ahead and get into it. It's my pleasure to welcome a fellow UCLA Bruin, uh, our good friend, Eddie Tavash. Welcome, Eddie. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Um, I want to welcome all of you to a presentation that, quite frankly, I hoped I'd never have to give. There is now a clear religious right-wing majority on the Supreme Court. But before we begin, I want to thank Robin Blumner, the president and CEO of the Center for Inquiry for helping to make this webinar happen. I want to thank CFI staff members, Jennifer Behan, Mark Kreidler, and Melissa Myers, who you see on the screen, for putting together the logistics of this presentation. And I want to thank the executive director of Center for Inquiry West, Jim Underdown, for assisting with the logistics of my appearance here today from CFI's headquarters in Los Angeles. And I want to thank CFI's general counsel, Nick Little, for helping me with the upcoming Supreme Court docket. And I want to help and thank any other staff member who was involved in putting together today's event. Unfortunately, with the confirmation on Monday of Justice Barrett to the Supreme Court, there is now for the first time ever a six to three religious right-wing majority on the court. Now, while we in the atheist free thought movement have been uplifted by the increase in non-believers and the religiously unaffiliated over the past few years, as revealed by various polls, the harsh reality has always been that a reconstituted Supreme Court with even a five to four religious right-wing majority let alone one that six to three, could easily roll back the societal gains that atheists and other non-religious people have made. If the new court majority starts to uphold religion promoting and special religion privileging laws, we could experience a severe undermining of our ability to compete with religion in the United States today. Even more ominously, the new court majority could actually curtail the civil rights of non-believers. A religion promoting law would be a restoration of official school prayer in public schools, for instance, which has been constitutionally prohibited since the court ruled in the case of Engel versus Vitale back in 1962. It could also happen in the form of once again allowing formal public school sponsored recitation of biblical verses, a practice that the court outlawed in Abington Township versus Shemp in 1963. Religious privileging laws are those in which only religious objectors and no one else can avoid complying with laws that bind everybody else. As an example of this, is when the Supreme Court ruled in Burwell versus Hobby Lobby in 2014 that only those with a religious objection can avoid complying with the Obamacare mandate that requires employers to provide health insurance policies to their employees that provide coverage for contraception. Now, there are two handouts that hopefully you'll be able to download. One is a history of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, which I didn't have time to go in verbally, and I demonstrate the framers did indeed intend to prevent government from favoring belief over non-belief. Now, time constraints again 
prevented me from making this part of the verbal presentation. And I also have provided for you the amicus brief I did for CFI in 07 before the California Supreme Court in their first same sex marriage case. And here I gave the justices of my home state Supreme Court the constitutional arguments for why no laws can be based on nothing more than religious beliefs. Now, what do we mean by this concept? Separation of church and state. For our purposes here, we take our definition from the 1947 Supreme Court case of Everson versus Board of Education. And this is a quote. The establishment of religion clause of the First Amendment means at least this, neither a state nor the federal government can set up a church. Neither can pass laws which aid one religion, aid all religions, or prefer one religion over another. Neither can force or influence a person to go or to remain away from church against their will or force them to profess a belief or disbelief in any religion. No person can be punished for entertaining or professing religious beliefs or disbeliefs or for church attendance or non-attendance. No tax in any amount, large or small, can be levied to support any religious activities or institutions, whatever they may be called or whatever form they may adopt to teach or practice religion. And then in 1961, in the case of Torcaso versus Watkins, the court emphatically restated this ideal. We repeat and again reaffirm that neither a state nor the federal government can constitutionally force a person to profess a religion, either in belief or disbelief, neither can any branch of government constitutionally pass laws or impose requirements that aid all religions against non-believers, and neither can those religions based on a belief in the existence of God be preferred over those that have different beliefs. But here is the key to our situation today. No branch of government can aid all religions as against non-believers. Tragically, this is what we are on the verge of losing. One of the most for important formulations of this concept was expressed by the court in 05 in the case of Mercury County versus ACLU. The court in a wonderful majority opinion by Justice Souter articulated it this way, no branch of government can favor religion over irreligion. This means that we non-believers have no greater rights than anyone else, but no fewer rights either. Now we have been and are facing a critical attack on the very notion of government neutrality in matters of religion. In what was luckily still a dissent in the Mercury County case, Justice Scalia, for whom the new justice, Amy Coney Barrett clerked, said the principle that government cannot favor religion over irreligion is demonstrably false. Well, that's a clear statement that we're second-class citizens if government can favor religion over us. But then chillingly, Scalia further writes, it's entirely clear from our nation's historical practices that the Establishment Clause permits this disregard of polytheists and believers in unconcerned deities, just as it permits the disregard of devout atheists. What does it mean the Constitution permits the disregard of devout atheists? How far can that go? At the time Scalia wrote this, there were still five justices who opposed his position on this and four who, including him, who were in support. Now there are six. What does it mean to say that religion can favor um, government can favor religion over irreligion. How far can that go? To what extent can government favor religion over irreligion? Can government treat prisoners more leniently 
if they participate in a religion program than those who don't. This has already been tried on a number of occasions and it required federal courts to strike down as unconstitutional, unconstitutional such special privileging of prisoners who participate in religious activities. Just this month, in a federal district court in Virginia, in the case of Young versus Newton, the court ruled that a jail is providing a special area reserved for only those who practice and participate in a specific Christian program. Such preference was unconstitutional. Now, most interestingly, again, keeping with the themes that our objective is for believers and non-believers to be equal before the law, this case was brought not by us, but by the Council on American Islamic Relations. Now in setting forth what the separation of church and state means, as we did earlier, the court said that government can't favor one religion over any other, in addition to not being able to favor religion collectively over non-belief. That means if the constitution is applied properly, government cannot say we side with all religions versus non-believers. And that is precisely the crucial linchpin of keeping our liberties together that we are about to lose by the new six to three super religious right majority on the Supreme Court. Now, if government can favor religion over irreligion, would the new religious right-wing majority on the court allow Congress to, for instance, permit only religious nonprofits to endorse candidates for political office, but still deny that right to secular nonprofits? This frightening concept of governments being able to favor religion over irreligion has never yet been the view of a majority of the justices. If it is adopted by this new majority, as unfortunately appears likely, we don't know the extent to which the court will allow government to discriminate against us non-believers and against those who simply don't profess any opinion or faith one way or another. Now, in a very extreme embrace of religious tyranny, Justice Clarence Thomas takes the view, this is totally preposterous, that the Establishment Clause was not meant to protect individual rights. He says that the Establishment Clause was meant to protect state establishments of religion. That means that Justice Thomas takes the view that the Establishment Clause was not meant to protect the rights of non-believers religious observers and religious minorities, its purpose as he sees it was to stop the federal government from interfering in official state religions, which he claims the states are permitted to have. What kind of recipe for civil strife is that? If each religion, if each state can have its own official religion and various sects are battling it out in the state legislature to see whose religion de jure will be the state religion uh, for that particular year. Now, last year, Thomas appearing at Pepperdine Law School said that he is dismayed at why atheists would even take oaths because we atheists don't believe in any supreme enforcer of such oaths. He additionally said that people of faith who swear an oath on the Bible work doubly hard to make sure they live up to it. Justice Thomas doesn't understand the Christianity he espouses. Look at it this way. If salvation by faith in Jesus is all that is necessary for eternal bliss, why even tell the truth? If faith alone has already saved you, a good person who rejects belief in Jesus will go to hell regardless of how much that individual endeavor to tell the truth. Whereas someone who intentionally lies under oath 
will still go to heaven if this person truly has accepted Jesus as Savior. So it's the Christian believer who has no incentive for telling the truth. One salvation by faith and faith alone has been secured. Now, what is the purview within the concept of church-state separation that triggers the involvement of the Center for Inquiry? For purposes of determining when CFI gets involved in the case under the rubric of preventing government from pr privileging religion and our trying to enforce overall government neutrality in matters of religion, we determine whether if our side loses, the side that wins will have obtained a special privilege available to only religious claimants or will the winning side have achieved a favoring of religion or religious beliefs on the part of the branch in government in question? In keeping with this approach, we have included in our concept of church state separation, cases that threaten LGBTQ rights and that jeopardize reproductive freedoms, including of course, access to abortion and contraception. Whenever there are legislative or regulatory efforts on the part of any branch of government to curtail or eliminate these freedoms. And this winds up in the courts, the effort on the part of our opponents are always made for religious reasons. Uh, no one yet has been able to show me an organization called Secular Humanists for Traditional Marriage. So I think that, as you'll see in the brief I wrote to the California Supreme Court, opposition to same-sex marriage has no secular component whatsoever. So therefore, the ban on same-sex marriage is an enactment of religious doctrine into law. Justice Barrett is unfortunately the latest newly powerful foot soldier for the religious right. During her confirmation hearings, she was asked if she thought the 1965 case of Griswold versus Connecticut, which struck down as unconstitutional all state bans on the use of contraception by married couples was a correctly decided case. She refused to answer. Even such religious right-wing justices as Samuel Alito, Chief Justice Roberts, and Thomas himself had no problem declaring during their confirmation hearings that they thought this case was correctly decided. In 2015, two years before she was confirmed as Trump's nominee to the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit in the Midwest, she co-signed a letter to the Synod Fathers from Catholic Women, which said in part, we give witness that the church's teachings on marriage and family founded in the indissoluble commitment of a man and a woman provide a sure guide to the Christian life. That's pretty frightening. In 2016, a year before she was appointed to her first federal judgeship, during a lecture at Jacksonville University, Barrett questioned whether the Supreme Court should have found nationwide constitutional protection for same-sex marriage as it did the previous year in Obergefell versus Hodges. She approvingly referred to the dissent of Chief Justice Roberts and said, those who want same-sex marriage, you have every right to lobby and state legislatures to make that happen. But the dissent's view to her was that it wasn't for the court to decide. If she takes the view that it isn't for the court to decide and that each state should decide if they will allow same-sex marriage, the Obergefell decision will be overruled and there will no longer be nationwide constitutional protection for the right of persons of the same gender to marry each other. The danger now posed by the new six to three religious right majority on the court doesn't just end with same-sex marriage. It extends to the basic freedoms 
and civil rights of members of the LGBTQ community. In 03, in Lawrence versus Texas, the court struck down all the laws that still, even at that late date, criminalized adult consensual intimacy among people of the same gender. The new six to three majority, even if it becomes a five to four majority, if one of the religious right wing uh, justices joins our side on this question, could easily overrule Lawrence and once allow, again, allow any state that was so inclined to reinstitute criminal penalties for same-sex intimacy. Talk about turning back the clock. Every court decision favoring LGBTQ rights had Justice Kennedy as the author of the majority opinion. Unfortunately, there is a real difference on these sets of issues between Kennedy and his former law clerk and now successor on the court, Justice Brett Kavanaugh. In the paperwork initially provided to the Senate for her confirmation hearings, Barrett initially failed to disclose two anti-abortion talks she gave in 2013. She also defended signing and then failing to initially disclose to the Senate Judiciary Committee two separate statements against Roe versus Wade. Uh, Connecticut Senator Richard Blumenthal, on the second day of her confirmation hearings, asked Barrett why she didn't disclose to the Senate her signing of a 2006 letter from the St. Joseph's County Right to Life League, an anti-abortion organization which advocates even for the criminalization of in vitro fertilization. And this was accompanying an ad calling for an end to what was referred to as the barbaric legacy of Roe versus Wade. This is Barrett's response, now a Supreme Court justice. I didn't have any recollection of that letter. I signed it almost 15 years ago on the way out of church. And then she also said that she originally believed that this letter was not something she needed to disclose because she did not belong to the sponsoring organization, even though she signed it. So she signed a letter calling for the overturning of abortion rights, but felt the Senate Judiciary Committee didn't need to see it just because even though she signed it, she was not part of the sponsoring organization. As a lawyer, I'm afraid of her type of reasoning. Well, she also did not say whether she thought Roe versus Wade was correctly or incorrectly, but she did say something that gives us an ominous and frightening clue. She said that she did not see this case, Roe, as a super precedent, which is a code word for a decision so settled that it can't be overturned. To her, Roe doesn't meet that standard. In 06, Barrett told graduates of the Notre Dame Law School, where she was a law professor, that they should see their upcoming legal careers as but a means to an end, and that end is building the kingdom of God. So replacing Ginsburg with Barrett can truly usher in an era of religious tyranny. Earlier, I mentioned how the destruction of government neutrality in matters of religion can come at us in two forms, the courts upholding of religion promoting legislations and number two, policies and its upholding of religious privileges, exemptions and special legislation so that only the religious can avoid complying with laws that are otherwise applicable to every other person. We saw how in 14, the court allowed religious employers who personally objected to contraception to be exempt from complying with the contraceptive mandate of the Affordable Care Act. Just this year, in Little Sisters of the Poor Saints, Peter and Paul, Home versus Pennsylvania, New Jersey, 
The court ruled that the Trump administration had the authority to expand employers' exemptions from having to provide employee health insurance that covers contraception. Ginsburg began her dissent, reminding the majority that in addressing religious freedom claims, the court, and this is a quote, does not allow the religious beliefs of some to overwhelm the rights and interests of others who do not share those beliefs. She then wrote, today for the first time, the court casts totally aside countervailing rights and interests in its zeal to secure religious rights to the nth degree. She further said that the government may not jettison an arrangement that promotes women workers well-being and instead defer entirely to employers' religious beliefs, particularly if that accommodation harms women who do not share those beliefs. Trump, as we know, has just replaced Ginsburg with Barrett, who we have every reason to expect will take the exact opposite position. Now the upcoming Supreme Court term, Next week, on November 4th, the day after the election, the court will hear the case of Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. Here, Philadelphia found out that some of its foster care providers would not license same-sex couples to be foster parents. The city ceased referring children to these agencies, including Catholic social services. The Catholic group sued the city arguing that it has a constitutional free exercise of religion claim to refuse to allow same-sex couples to become foster parents because of the church's opposition to same-sex couples. The Catholic Church is essentially uh, arguing that any religious organization has a special right to be exempt from Philadelphia's otherwise universally applicable law prohibiting the city from funding discriminatory foster care and adoption programs. This is a most horrendous and egregious instance of a religion demanding an unconstitutional special privilege. A government funded program should not assist those organizations and individuals involved in placing children in foster care who would reject foster parents just because those foster parents are an LGBTQ couple. No branch of government with taxpayer money should fund foster care activity where religious dogma will be used to reject an entire category of otherwise qualified foster care parents. Now, the free exercise clause of the First Amendment was intended as a shield, not a sword. It was not meant to give the religious greater rights than others. It was meant to make sure that the religious don't have fewer rights than anyone else. Let me give you an example of a valid free exercise claim. The uh, city of Hialeah, Florida, in order to stop members of the Santeria church from sacrificing animals as part of their rituals, passed an ordinance that allowed anyone to kill animals for any reason, except for religious purposes. The ordinance would allow somebody to kill an animal for no reason, but not if the reason were one of a religiously motivated practice of animal sacrifice. And there the Supreme Court said, you cannot single out only a religious belief system for lesser rights than what everybody else has. In May of last year, 2019, Trump and Pence had the Department of Human Services issue a regulation that permitted those with religious objections to withhold medical care based on those objections. Luckily, federal trial courts struck down this denial of care regulation. The language was so broad that it could have allowed a paramedic 
to refuse to rescue a gay man from a collapsed building if the paramedic claimed a religious objection to doing so. The whole realm of allowing the religious only to get away with violating anti-discrimination laws if the basis for demanding an exemption from compliance is their religion could be potentially unlimited. Now, this is scary, but let's think about this since we're getting close to Halloween anyway. What if a restaurant owner who does business with the general public claims a sincerely held religious objection to doing any business with atheists? And during the busy lunch hour, members of the general public coming in, could that restaurant owner legally away, get away with turning down non-believers and refusing to seat them at the lunch counter? What does that remind us of? This is where we can see that the new court majorities permitting religion promoting government action and religious privileging action could lead to the actual erosion of the civil rights of us non-believers. If individually religious people who do business with the general public in secular businesses can refuse to do business with atheists because of a claim sincerely held belief that doing business with non-believers violates the business owner's religious beliefs, the legally permissible discrimination against us could be open-ended. Now think of this example. A lending institution, a bank or other mortgage business that does business with the general public could conceivably be allowed to refuse to make a loan to an atheist, even if this prospective customer meets the financial criteria for such a loan, merely because the owners of this lending business assert a religious-based aversion to serving atheist customers, which means that lending institutions, if so inclined, could assert a religious disapproval of dealing with atheists and atheists would have no longer any legal recourse when they're turned down for a loan. We talked earlier about the Torcaso versus Watkins case. Let me explain what that was about. 1961, the state of Maryland would not allow the plaintiff to become a notary public because he would not declare a belief in God. Maryland's highest court refused to see this as a constitutional crisis. It said that all that is happening to the plaintiffs is that he can't hold office because of his refusal to declare a belief in God and that he is not compelled to hold office in the first place. The Supreme Court rejected this reasoning and said that the fact that people aren't compelled to hold public office cannot possibly be an excuse for barring them from holding office because of a state imposed criterion that is forbidden by the constitution. So here, 59 years ago, we had a state wanting to prevent someone from holding public office just because they wouldn't assert belief in God, even though article six, section three of the constitution explicitly prohibits any religious test for public office. Will the new religious right wing majority on the Supreme Court consider overturning the Torcaso decision? Could it go that far? How far can this go in allowing government to favor religion over irreligion? In her last opinion, before retiring from the court in 05, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, in a concurring opinion, again in the McCreary County case, said that, as we've been discussing, she admonished her colleagues on the court not to abandon government neutrality in matters of religion. And though she, she was regarded as a centrist or a moderate conservative, she had a 
universal concern for human rights that transcended any ideological boundaries. And as she said to her colleagues, those who would renegotiate the boundaries between church and state must therefore answer a difficult question. Why would we trade a system that has served us so well for one that has served others so poorly? Later, as the years went on, she expressed disappointed, a disappointment with the decisions of her successor, Justice Alito, who was a staunch opponent of the separation of church and state. We, all of us gathered here for this webinar, the defenders of church-state separation are the benevolent and magnanimous ones in this struggle. Unlike our opponents, we don't want special rights for only ourselves. We want equal rights for everyone, believers and non-believers alike. Our main concern now is that we are on the verge of being pushed into actual second-class citizenship because of the new and extreme religious right-wing majority on the court. There are many of you watching now who supported CFI in the past with your generosity. We hope we can count on you in the future because we, church-state separationists, atheists, agnostics, secular humanists, even religious dissenters, we are under siege unlike ever before. The struggle to preserve equal rights for everyone, regardless of viewpoint on matters of religion, is a struggle to preserve the very core of modern civilization itself. It is a struggle to stave off the barbaric horrors of religious tyranny. This is a cause so important, it's a battle so necessary that even if understandably we become disheartened, we must participate in this effort whether or not we ultimately prevail. Regardless of how long it takes, we must never abandon the core of American constitutional values, the freedom of conscience for everyone, which is even known as the first freedom. The religious right prides itself on being true patriots. No claim could be more counterfeit. We, the defenders of a legal system in which no branch of government can treat people differently based on their either accepting or rejecting any aspect of religious or theological beliefs. We are the true keepers of the flame of what the founders intended to be the real America, and that is a nation that for all time upholds the equal rights of everybody in terms of matters of religion. That is to say, the framers intended, and it falls to us to protect and preserve the separation of church and state. Thank you for joining today, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Eddie. Um, it's always wonderful to hear you speak. You're you're full of fascinating information, but it's all bad news. <laughs> um, Eddie, I have some questions for you from our um, from our audience, and the uh, the first one is kind of I'm going to combine two from two different folks because they're a little bit similar. Okay, so this is from Ed Buck. Ed Buckner asks, "Is there anything we can do?" And then to follow up, Carolyn asks. What are our practical options as citizens to deal with this issue? My view is that writing and talking with our representatives and senators is worthless, especially here in Alaska. Been there, done that. Um, so what are, your, what are your thoughts? What can we do about this? These are excellent questions. And right now, my answer will be frustrating because there is a limit, as the questioners have acknowledged, on what we can do. Uh, right now, CFI has not taken a position on, and we are not ready to discuss 
or talk about whether or not there should be court packing. So I can't speak for the organization on that. Uh, one of the things we have to do is to start electing church state separationist people, regardless of whether they are individually believers or not, to state legislatures to stop the avalanche of pro-religion legislation. The problem with that is that state legislatures are a virtual nonstop assembly line for religion promoting legislation. It's in the state legislation, legislatures, particularly in certain states, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, where we can get all of these religion promoting, abortion restricting, uh, LGBTQ oppressing laws that we can't even think of. And to me right now, the most immediate precious liberty that will fall after almost 50 years is constitutional blanket protection for the right of abortion, which since January 22nd, 1973, no state can abridge. The votes are there. Mm -hmm. Even if let's say one of the religious right wing justices has a rare moment of true conscience and says, I can't do this to the women of America and joins our side we would still lose five to four. At this point, for Roe versus Wade to be preserved, two out of the six religious right-wing justices would have to vote with our remaining three justices. It's not very likely. So what we can do, try to elect people who support secular government regardless of whether they're personally believers or not, to political office. And then to regard, now we're a nonprofit, we can't endorse or oppose specific candidates for specific office. But I've been saying for 40 years, every presidential election and every election for the US Senate should be seen as primarily a referendum on the Supreme Court. The president nominates and the Senate can accept or reject. If the president favors the religious right, as is currently the case, and the Senate favors the religious right by majority vote, as is the case, we can expect tragedies like Justice Barrett to happen indefinitely. Right. Um, so on that, sort of like in that vein, we have some questions, a couple of questions about the sort of the structure of the court. Now I know that we as CFI, we can't take a, we don't have a position on this, but sort of personally, how do you feel about things like um, the number of seats, term limits, um, leg legislative uh, limit limits on the uh, authority of the court? How do you feel about these types of procedural things? Is this something that Biden should look at doing? What, how do you how Well, do you feel the reason that? why I haven't formulated an opinion on that and why as an active atheist, this is the only thing I'm agnostic on, is that we don't know how it'll play out, whether it's a double-edged sword or not. Mm -hmm. And so right now, Realistically, all I can do is confine my comments to the importance of presidential and Senate election when it comes to the court. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when we had the majority, the religious right wanted to take away from the court the right to rule on First Amendment religious cases. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I can say this. Whatever the makeup of the court is and whatever the length of the terms, we must have an unelected body 
that doesn't have to face the voters when it comes to interpreting the First Amendment, because the First Amendment is specifically meant to be counter majoritarian. Uh, the First Amendment means, at least up until this moment, the First Amendment means that if I want to say whatever I want in disparaging religious belief systems, even if 90% of the American people think I should be punished, I can't be. The First Amendment means that if 98% of a given state believe that Buddhists should not be able to hold voluntary meditation sessions, that that majority doesn't count. In 1943, in West Virginia School District versus Barnett, the Supreme Court upheld the right of Jehovah's Witnesses not to salute the flag even though the state wanted to mandate it. And Justice Jackson mentioned that these freedoms, these rights of conscience, whether it's speech or expression or viewpoint on matters of religion are subject to no vote and depend on the outcome of no election. So mm -hmm. while I don't yet, I haven't yet formulated what my views are on all these possible alternatives I do just cling to one bedrock principle, which is whatever form they take, whatever changes might be made, we can never have a decision-making body that is responsive to voters decide First Amendment issues. Mm -hmm. Well, so how would, how would, would that, in your sort of scenario, is that a, elected a no, body no, what I mean is, is that is that there will always have to be whether there's term limits whether there's nine justices or 25 mm -hmm. whatever it is so there has there to be someone always, who's isolated from the yeah, voters yeah, yeah there always right. must be an unanswerable supreme court when it comes to the bill of rights absolutely otherwise there'll be majority tyranny yeah no uh, um that sorry that makes that makes perfect sense now um how feasible um is the is the idea of even pressing for um reforms in the judicial system is that something that is an attainable goal well you see the problem is i mean it's a very good question but the problem right now is it's not a question of reforming the judicial system because we have to know what those reforms mean. Again, mm -hmm. we don't want the Supreme Court to be bereft of jurisdiction over any Bill of Rights, constitutional rights cases, because it'll lead to majority tyranny. Uh, so right now, our problem as non-believers and even believers who support government neutrality in matters of religion for everybody. Our problem is the six to three majority. Mm -hmm. So immediately what we have to do is we have to try to pressure both our state legislatures and Congress not to enact religion favoring laws that this new Supreme Court majority would uphold. See, I know it's frustrating, but I, 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 I can't really address what reforms would work now and what wouldn't. Right. Uh, my, because I, I don't know, I don't know how the math plays out. Mm -hmm. No, no, that, and then that's fair. It, some of these things are definitely fully dependent on on what happens in a in a little under a week's time, right? We, we, we have to know if we even get to climb that mountain. Now, I do have a really great question here for you from Richard who asks, how can congressional legislation be crafted to stand up to scrutiny under this new 6-3 court? Yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful question. 
and what it goes to, if I'll take the liberty of sort of elaborating on it, is if the current court majority strikes down Roe versus Wade, can Congress by mere legislation enact a law that would disallow any state from outlawing abortion? Mm -hmm. The problem with that is once the Supreme Court says there is no longer a recognized constitutional protection for abortion that blankets the entire nation, then Congress's attempt to legislate that would be struck down by the same Supreme Court unless Congress could find another valid provision. Uh, but you see, the whole purpose of striking down Roe versus Wade is to say that each state legislature is now able to decide. If the court says each state legislature is now able to decide, then Congress effort to blanket the nation with total coverage for abortion rights may not be accepted. It would come down to, sorry, getting a little bit technical, a question of interpreting the 10th amendment, which is what can Congress legislate for the whole nation and what is reserved for what we call the police power of the individual states. But you see, here's the problem with that. I mean, the idea is great, but once the court says there is no United States constitutional basis for abortion rights, then Congress probably won't be permitted to supersede the states unless it comes up with a valid constitutional anchor, which the court will just have struck down in overturning role. Oh my goodness. Every single thing you say is, is just dark. It's just dark. All right. Um, you know, earlier this month, one of our, one of our, um, one of our audience members is asking about a piece in the Atlantic every earlier this month. Did you happen to see it that, that said why the title was why Amy Coney Barrett might surprise everyone. Do you think we're likely to be surprised by Justice Barrett? Is that, is that the reason? I wish that could be true. The last time the religious right made a miscalculation in our favor was in 1990 with Justice David Souter. Mm -hmm. He had no track record. Right. What happened was he was on the New Hampshire Supreme Court. Bush Sr. put him on the first district court of appeals for New England. And he had no track record on these issues. And at the time, a uh, major Bush advisor uh, from New Hampshire, John Sununu told Bush, this will be a home run for the conservatives. That was the last mm -hmm. time the religious right misfired with a, an appointment to the Supreme Court because all the others have had a paper trail the one who didn't turned out to be the strongest religious right winger of all, Clarence Thomas. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Barrett has a paper trail, signing right. letters calling for the overturning of abortion, favorably referring to the chief justice's dissent in the same sex marriage case, talking about law students being directed to ultimately devote their practices to the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a blank slate. Right. I would like to be wrong. I'd like nothing more than to see a Justice Barrett who says, now that I'm here for life and nobody can touch me, um, fooled you all and turn out to be like Justice Souter or the next Ginsburg. I. I want to be wrong, but I don't think it's going to happen. Mm, no, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not super hopeful, but you know, the, one of one of our questions does sort of address the fact that the that the court historically has kind of gravitated 
a little bit leftward after they've been appointed, like O'Connor and Souter are both examples of that. Um, I, I do want to get back to sort of the abortion topic because there are some really great questions in that vein. One is from Michael, and it says that, you know, basically we just have to pray as <laughs> that that Roe v. Wade is is upheld. And and Susan adds, given that certain states will likely outlaw abortion, um, some will allow it. Can a state that uh, outlaws abortion prevent cross state travel for women who are looking to have those services? That is a very, very profound question. And the reason why it gave me a start is because in my days uh, from 1981 to 01 as the primary public speaker and debater for the California Abortion Rights Action League, I dealt with that. And I would say no, uh, that the state shouldn't be able to do that, except there is one problem that haunts me. Um, okay, we are skeptics, but this is not the issue here. Uh, Laetrile treatment, an alternative cancer treatment, which CFI recognizes as bogus, is not legal in, in, in California. When parents of a child suffering from cancer took their child to Mexico for laetrile treatment, this was almost maybe even 30, 40 years ago, they were prosecuted when they came back from Mexico for taking the California resident child out of state to jeopardize that child. I don't know what will happen if a state deems the fertilized egg, embryo, fetus, a child, and then says, you can't take a Alabama child to New York to kill it. Because if you, then it's the same reasoning. Uh, I would say that they can't do that. And what I would probably come up with, and you see, and this would be a horrible burden on women, is on paper, move to the pro-choice state, stay there for the time necessary for residency requirements, be a resident of that state where you have the abortion, and then afterwards, at some point, move back to your home state. It may be, I mean, I, I don't want to see women to have to go through this. So we don't right. know. See, the question is an excellent question because we don't know how far this court will go. Will the six mm -hmm. religious right wing justices be happy to allow the states that want to to ban abortion and be satisfied with that? Or will they also want them to be able to go after their own residents who leave the state for other states? See, again, we don't know how far the newly constituted religious right wing majority will go. Right, right. And, and so many of the women who are in this position are folks who are of limited means to begin with. Um, a lot of times state residency requirements for any old thing are months, years, you know, like it's not it doesn't it doesn't leave options it's not it's not a real option for 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 so many people um now i want to just kind of pivot a little bit to the 2016 in 2016 the republican senate stopped barack obama's nominee merrick garland and they did that big old 180 Left this last this year, as if that never happened. Is it possible to draft a law to to keep that type of behavior from happening in future? It's a very wonderful, profound question, and there is a chance such a law could be constitutional, because just like Congress can set the number of justices uh, and set their terms. If Congress passed a law saying 
no president during a presidential election year shall replace any vacancy on the Supreme Court. It might be valid. Mm -hmm. But then again, in order for that to be, that law to be valid, five out of the nine current justices would have to say, yes, Congress has this power. So the question is, would we get five justices on the current Supreme Court to say, yes, Congress has the legal right to pass legislation so that vacancies on our court cannot be filled during the calendar year of a presidential election? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually going to discuss this with our general counsel, Nick Little, and see what his take is, because I, uh, but it, it certainly, my initial response is, since Congress can do other things to and with the court, as long as it doesn't tinker with its jurisdiction over specific subject matter, that if the Supreme Court is honest about it, I mean, okay, if I were on the court, and then do it liberal or conservative, if I were on the court, from what I know today, I would vote to uphold such legislation. But mm -hmm. uh, I have to wait to see, I would have to wait to see the specifics. You know, I just destroyed my chance of becoming a Supreme Court justice because I gave my opinion on a case that could come before me. <laughs> you, you, tipped your, you tipped your hand a little bit there, pal. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit more pivoting, right? Just kind of back to the separation of church and state in general. Um, historically, we got a, we have a really great question from Jeffrey who asks, how do we come to have a separation of church and state in America to begin with? And Carolyn adds, has there been an evolution of all states' constitutional statements about the separation of church and state? And can that but yeah, these are really these are really good historical questions. Uh, in the first handout, and also in the Supreme Court brief, I talk about how the founders specifically intended for there to be equal rights for non-believers and government neutrality in matters of religion. But the historical exposition was so lengthy we didn't have time for that. But I will just right. mention that the principal author of the First Amendment was James Madison, whose primary influence was Thomas Jefferson. And <clears throat> uh, Madison introduced the first draft of the First Amendment in uh, 1789. In 1786, when Jefferson was in Paris as ambassador, Madison secured through the Virginia legislature, the bill for religious freedom, which protected the rights of conscience of everyone. And toward the end of his life in 1821, Jefferson said that he was delighted that his and Madison's bill protected everyone, including the infidel of every denomination. Also a few months before introducing the uh, First Amendment into the First Congress. Madison wrote to Jefferson, worried that the general public would narrow the rights of conscience if they had a chance. Also, mm -hmm. looking to Madison in his attached memoranda years later, after he was president himself, being the fourth president, he even opposed the principal author of the First Amendment even opposed religious institutions holding property, mm -hmm. which is something that church state separationists don't do today. So we can clearly see that in the minds of the framers, it was uppermost. Also, on September 3rd of 1789, when it was to become the First Amendment was sent to the Senate, there were two proposals which would have meant only that government cannot favor one religion over others. 
but not mean that government uh, must also treat non-believers equally. And both those wordings, which would have only prevented government from favoring one religion over the other, were both rejected and never brought back. And then Madison, as chair of the Joint Senate House Committee, came up with the broadest possible language. There shall be no law respecting an establishment of religion. You can't even show respect to an establishment of religion. So I think the history is clear. It, more fleshed out if people read the accompanying materials. As far as the states are concerned, the answer is yes, until recently. They're called Blaine Amendments, which are state amendments that prevent the state from giving monetary aid to religious institutions. And unfortunately, the religious right, with some success in the courts, is getting the religious right is getting the Supreme Court to say that these Blaine amendments are unconstitutional because they deprive the free exercise equal rights of the religious. And that's a very delicate area that just beginning to fall on top of us. Mm. That's, yeah, that's that 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 is a delicate line to tread. Yeah. You know, we are trying to make sure that you know all citizens are are afforded their individual rights, and that line is is um, is very thin in spots. Yeah. I would like to um, ask you about um, that, Nick. I'm passing along a question from Nick. It says the Supreme Court can any Supreme Court justice really put aside their personal beliefs and and issues when they're when they're considering these cases as they say they do is that a real I thing for humans I some can and have but the question is will they see i i um cfi does not believe in telepathy so i can't read their <laughs> minds sure uh i i think um uh, i think they can um, I have one example, um, Anthony Kennedy, who was a moderate conservative, but was with us on church state separation 51.5% of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, every major LGBTQ rights issue that one our way in the courts, he wrote the majority opinion. Uh, right. In Texas versus Johnson, where the court in 1989 by a five to vote majority said that burning an American flag cannot be banned just because it's offensive. As long mm -hmm. as somebody is not using somebody else's flag or government property, you buy your own flag and tear it up or set it on fire. Mere offensiveness can never be a basis for banning any kind of expression. Kennedy making the five vote majority said, sometimes you are compelled to make decisions you don't like, so the defendant in this case must go free. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I think that was one example, but generally speaking, if you look at Clarence Thomas particularly, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to religion, or you look at Alito, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, Barrett, and Chief Roberts, I, I really haven't yet seen evidence that a firmly, deeply held religious conviction by a religious right-wing justice is something that that justice, though agonizing, clearly puts aside in rendering a decision. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that yet. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I, I, I'm drawing any blanks for any possible examples there too. Um, I would like to ask a, re a slightly related question from Stuart who, who says, several recent SCOTUS decisions have privileged religious liberty over other rights. How 
can we better promote the idea that religious liberty requires the protection of the rights of the non-religious? Isn't that what the founders had in mind? Yes, that's exactly what the founders intended. And the questioner is recognizing the self-evident nature of what we're saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, it shows a, a great understanding of the fundamental fairness. And the answer is to show how benevolent we are. Our opponents want to restrict our rights. Mm -hmm. We don't want to restrict their rights. Right. We want everybody to have equal rights. They don't. So the only way to put this over for the American people to sell it, as it were, is to make the argument that everyone benefits when we are all equally free in matters of conscience on issues pertaining to religion. Now, for those who believe that atheists cannot be morally trusted and that we must prefer the religious, like all those voters who never vote for an otherwise qualified atheist for president, we have mm -hmm. quite an argument to make. You see, this is why up until this moment in time, we always needed a Supreme Court that said, whether you like atheists or not, whether you like the non-religious or not, they have equal rights. Mm. No, with, that's, you know, it's, it's law should never be about who you like, who you don't yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but, you know, unfortunately we find ourselves in that situation some of the time. Now uh, to sort of like dovetail onto the, those two questions, this one's a little bit related as well from Gordon who, who would like to know, how can we accept that a judge rules favorably on a religious belief without presenting a rational evidence-based dissertation on the fairness of said belief? Okay. That's a very, very good question. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's um, uh, this is really, uh, it, it, the answer is a curious one. <laughs> and that's this, judges who want to mask their religious motive will say this, mm -hmm. I'm not for or against this. I just don't believe it has national constitutional protection. It's up to the state. Classic example, Lawrence versus Texas, the case I mentioned where the Supreme Court said by then six to three majority, the states can no longer punish consensual sexual acts among consenting adults of the same gender to strike down Texas's prohibitory law. Clarence Thomas said in his dissent from that, that if he were in the Texas legislature, he'd vote to strike down and repeal this silly law. But yet, even though he thinks it's a bad law, there's no constitutional basis for invalidating it. That's what they do. Um, 1998, I went back to my, I was invited back to my alma mater, Loyola Law School of Los Angeles to meet Justice Scalia, who was speaking there. Mm -hmm. And I asked him if I could ask him questions, and he said yes. And we talked about abortion. And he said, people get me wrong. He said, I, I'm not saying whether abortion should be legal or not. I'm saying it's up to the states. He said, if a state, he looked at me and says, goes your way, and allows abortion, I'm not gonna knock it down. If a state bans abortion, I'm not gonna lock it down, knock it down. I'm leaving it to the states. Mm -hmm. So you see, that is the smoke screen. The, right. the, technically the difference between many religious right legal thinkers and us is not even whether something is good or bad or should or should not be allowed. It's who decides. With abortion, we say 
the woman decides. Mm -hmm. They say, no, the state legislature decides. If you say the woman decides, it means that you believe there is blanket nationwide protection for abortion rights. Mm -hmm. If you say, no, the state legislatures decide, it means there is nothing in the national constitution to protect the right. The woman is at the mercy of her state legislator. Right, right. And as we know, uh, state legislatures are really great at knowing what's going on in people's lives and making great decisions for them. Um, let me ask you a question from our good friend, Rick, um, who asks um, a question based on a New York Times article says Maryland and six other states have articles in their constitution saying that people who don't believe in God are not eligible to hold public office. Why, why is that allowed? Okay. In the original constitution, mm. even before the bill of rights, uh, the constitution as passed in 1787 ratified in 1789, article six, section three prohibits any religious test for public office. Mm -hmm. In the 1961 case that I talked about, Tercasa versus Watkins, the state of Maryland, of all places, try to enforce their prohibition by saying, no, you don't have to adopt a religion. You just have to affirm a belief in God to hold any office, including that of notary public. The Supreme Court unanimously struck that down. So those laws may exist, but they're no longer valid. My fear which I hope is an excessive fear. Uh, I hope I'm being excessively neurotic and worrisome here is with the new six vote religious right majority even reconsider the Torcaso decision. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be overt tyranny and bigotry against the non-believer and given article six section three i don't see how that would happen unless the religious right accepted the argument that that was part of the national constitution and only the bill of rights was incorporated to apply to the states and so in a kind of twisted clarence thomas style reasoning saying article six section three only applies to the federal government not the states mm. just like thomas says that the Establishment Clause only restrains the federal government, not the states. Right, right. Yeah. No, that, that the, yeah. the thing is, if, if you're in the constitutional church-state separation business, you learn to detect the smoke screens. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you will, you will have to. You will have to. Yeah. The field is the field is nothing but smoke screens at this point. Um, so I have a, another sort of like justice related question. Um, and this is, this is from Ronald and it says, what are the, cho the chances that court members would be influenced by clear public opinion on LGBTQ and abortion issues? Of course, there's no obligation on their part, but surely they, they must be aware of public opinion. Is that because okay. that's playing they a role. They are public opinion, but they're not bound by it. Right. Just like in 1954, in the historic Brown versus Board of Education, when the court struck down as unconstitutional, officially segregated public schools, a mm -hmm. majority of Americans opposed that decision. More clearly, in 1962 and 1963, when the court struck down official public school prayer and Bible reading, mm -hmm. an overwhelming majority of the American people opposed that decision. Uh, so I think that the justices will either vote their agenda or vote what they think the law should be irrespective of popular will, unless it's the kind of legislation where a popular majority can have sway. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if the majority of the residents of a city vote to eliminate a dam because it's polluted, 
I, I think that all members of the court would say that's where majority rule is proper. Uh -huh. But if all members of that same town, let's say that 99% of the voters of that town say that the Hindu temple at its gatherings within the city limits should not be permitted to talk about reincarnation, then no justice hopefully would uphold that. So, uh, certainly, certainly. So, so sometimes the public is, is full of it, right? Yeah. And we don't, we don't want to listen to them anyway. So yeah. like we need to, we need to have I, that. Um, I'm not a, I don't want to go into a dead end. Mm -hmm. um, I think that when there are demonstrations outside the Supreme Court, it's to affect public opinion in terms of how the public will vote. Mm. I don't think that it's effective to think you're affecting the, the very, very decision-making of the justices. The right. justices don't look outside and say there are 5,000 people for same-sex marriage, 500 against, so that tips the balance of my thinking. It doesn't work that way. Right. Well, and, and I, I suppose, you know, now that now that you sort of like lay out all sides of it, it's, it's certainly, we're, we are grateful. Um, and then now here, here's one that's on many of our minds right now, um, especially those of us who, who are or love um, LGBTQ folks, uh, which is asked by Edward, who says our gay neighbor, neighbor duly married in Georgia, could their marriage be overturned? Or would is it, is it be more likely to be something that's grandfathered in, quote unquote? She that's that a very just, good uh, question. I'm afraid of what this court would do. I would argue that since same-sex marriages were constitutional at the time that mm -hmm. they were entered into, that the court cannot undo them because they were valid and legal at the time, mm -hmm. even if the court can remove constitutional protection from future such marriages. I also hope that the court, if it overturns Obergefell, won't say that states other than the ones in which the valid for that state same-sex marriage was entered into can now mm -hmm. refuse to recognize it. Uh, right. I think that those who are in currently valid same-sex marriages have mm -hmm. a vested interest in that relationship not being nullified by a subsequent Supreme Court decision, even if it's no longer protected to enter into future such relationships. But sure. I don't know what would happen. I, I, my sense is the court would first overturn Obergefell and then some state would want to refuse to recognize those already entered into, and then a second case would come before the court. Right. Um, yeah, I've, I've known, I have a handful of folks in my life who are, who are looking to get married real quick, real quick, just in case, just because of the, the uncertainty of the situation, um, which is a horrifying place to be right now. Um, and then we're looking to wrap up. So, you know, we're, we're kind of at the end of our end of our evening here together. It's been great. I would like to ask one more question that I think will kind of get us all off and, and thinking about ways that we can affect change in our communities. What can we do to creatively discredit the religious right? What we can do is, okay, now wearing my CFI hat, mm. I think it's important that with all the things we do, we continue to promote and support the philosophical and scientific arguments for atheism so that we can defend the intellectual validity 
of atheists, and then politically and legally promote the benevolent idea of equal rights for everyone. So first demonstrate why atheists should not be shunned and then argue from a place of fundamental fairness, a place of fundamental fairness that everyone should be equal before the law, regardless of their viewpoint on matters of religion, that your standing, your official standing in society should not depend in any way on your belief system as to how the universe is put together. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to get moderate religious believers, liberal religious believers, and even those who are uncertain to recognize the full equality of everyone. And as I've been saying for 40 years, we need to get true conservatives mm -hmm. to recognize that you cannot be a limited government conservative if you support the religious right. In 1989, uh, then New York Governor Mario Cuomo came to Los Angeles to speak and he worded it very beautifully. He said, it's rank hypocrisy for the religious right to preach to us about limited government and then um, to turn around and tell us the American people what God to believe in and how to apply the judgment of that God to our bodies and to our bedrooms. Mm -hmm. It's, it, we are uh, in absolutely unprecedented times. I would like to just smack on one final teeny tiny little question, just because I think that it is an important one to ask. And what, how, how could uh, adding the ERA amendment um, help in this, if at all? I don't know if it would help in abortion rights. It might because we could then say that a combination of the ERA and the 14th Amendment may stop the discrimination that affects only women, but then the court might say, it's not gender-based, it's biologically based. Mm -hmm. And it's not our fault that only women get pregnant. But, but certainly uh, in other areas, uh, for instance, in my article coming out in Free Inquiry, uh, extolling Ginsburg's memory, uh, she handled a case for the Supreme Court in the 70s where mm -hmm. Louisiana made it harder for women to serve on juries than men. Right. There was no, there's no sound basis for that other than misogyny, but I think the ERA would definitely help in something like that. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, my friends, it, it, we've come to the end of a wonderful uh, evening together. I hope that you have voted. If not, get thee to the polls. If you have early voting in your area, go get early voting. If you are voting on the day, be safe and make sure that you make that voice heard. They would make it so hard if it wasn't important, right? All right, thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thank you very much for spending your time with us. Um, we thank you for your questions. We thank you for your participation. Have a great evening. Good night. Thank you, Eddie.